I've said it before, I believe, but uh, you know you're moving up in the world when your customers are giving you Hummers in your garage. All right, here's what we're doing today. All right, my apologies for not making a video for some time, but uh, the company I work for actually lifted their COVID restrictions uh, and started travel again. So I've actually been traveling like a road warrior for the past few weeks now. And um, unfortunately, it's going to kind of suck for a little bit as that will continue. But uh, also on the weekends, I have been absolutely hammered with cars, sometimes as many as six or seven in a weekend. And then, of course, with traveling, I have to finish them over the weekend. So unfortunately, we missed some pretty good case studies as I just plain didn't have time to film. But I've only got three cars this weekend. And um, unfortunately, this beauty right here won't be one of them that we'll be working on. But I am excited about the one that's coming in any minute now. So uh, this Hummer H2 that's kind of decked out, this is a really cool ride. This has a leaking HydroBoost system. Some of you guys are wondering, what is a HydroBoost? A uh, HydroBoost system is kind of a fancy addition with the power steering to give a further assistance during braking, especially on a large vehicle like this. And um, what happens is you get a uh, leak with the power steering fluid, and you keep having to add power steering fluid, but the leak is actually up here, and uh, you run your finger under the power brake unit and you can see I can pick up some fresh power steering fluid. It's um, kind of an interesting system but the power steering hoses if you uh, pay attention to them they actually connect up behind the brake reservoir and uh, that is what is leaking. Uh, a couple of things you can do about that. You can replace the unit, which is what I am going to do. Or there's also a rebuild kit available uh, if you want to save um, a probably a couple hundred bucks actually, and you can uh, rebuild by replacing all the seals in it. I unfortunately will not have time to do that, so I'm just gonna be replacing this unit and of course, we're not going to show that. That's just going to be a bunch of bolts spinning. doesn't take any brains or skill to do that. We want to do this next car that's coming in, but this diagnosis is very easy. Leaking Hydro Boost unit. This diagnosis is completed, so we are on to the next thing now. All right, the second car I am actually really excited about, so hopefully we've got a good one for you. And this car has a service charging system light on. Uh, I actually don't even know what the car is, but the guy gave me some screenshots. Let me grab my phone. That's the warning light that he gets, and obviously wouldn't normally be super exciting except for the fact that uh, apparently it is not the battery or the alternator. So I was in uh, California working for almost two weeks and uh, instead of waiting for me to get back, he was getting a little worried about it. Even though there's no symptoms, he says, he hasn't noticed any drivability symptoms, no trouble starting the car, anything like that. But uh, he was getting a little worried about it, so he took it to a uh, shop, uh, like a uh, Big O Tires or something like that. And uh, they did battery test and alternator test, and they said that it was neither of them. They, they couldn't figure out what the problem was, but uh, they were saying that it might be a bad pulley or something like that, which quite honestly, I'm not buying, and neither did he. So uh, because there weren't any symptoms or anything, he decided to wait until I can look at it. But uh, according to the shop, it is not a battery, not an alternator. So um, why is the charging system service light on? That will be a good one. I actually have an idea and we'll go over it um, because I, I know the direction that I'm going to go. But we certainly aren't going to throw a battery and alternator in it and uh, not because the shop said so but because we are going to check them anyway even though the shop did but uh, we, we're, what is your 98 percent are going to do they're going to probably be smart and start with a battery and then when the battery doesn't fix it they're going to then do the alternator because the alternator is more expensive and then when that doesn't work then they take it to a shop but um, and actually uh, um, they would use their mantra in between that remember uh, the the parts changer mantra if you're not familiar they would change the battery, the battery won't fix it, but what do they say? What's the mantra? 
they're going to rationalize it as it needed it anyway. That's the parts changer mantra if you're not familiar. Uh, check engine lights on, you replace the oxygen sensors, that doesn't fix it. That's all right, it needed it anyway. Right, um, we are not gonna do things that way obviously. So, uh, and then the third car. We've got a third car coming in later that uh, has a, um, the way the guy described it, whenever he makes a turn, it feels like the rear brakes grab. So uh, that's all I know. I asked him if he noticed any ABS lights or anything like that. He says he didn't notice anything, but uh, I'm kind of hoping we have an ABS problem, something good. So um, let me do this. I am going to go and just get that Hummer out of here so I've got room to work and film and everything, and then we will check out that alternator light issue. All right, so we're going to very quickly go over my game plan here for when this car gets in. And uh, we're going to just uh, very briefly go over specifically what I think the issue will be with this car. Uh, because I do have a complete diagnosis and understanding of alternators and charging systems on my pay channel at www.schrodingersboxqm.com. That's Schrodinger's Box Quantum Mechanics where you can go to get really detailed instruction, learning wire diagrams, step-by-step uh, -step on how to do some of this more advanced electrical and computerized testing. But um, what we're going to do is a little bit of review from that, uh, just for guys who are not members of it, because it's going to be integral for this video. So there's a, a couple of ways that this charging light system uh, would, would be a failure, but the thing is we want to understand how the system works with the charging light. What's the deal with how it's connected and why it would be possible you can have the charging light on but not have a problem with the charging system. Uh, the alternator and battery apparently are working fine. So um, if we look at the most basic level, uh, again, I don't know what car this is, but just by looking at that warning light on the dashboard, I know it's not going to work this way most likely, but this is just a way to get an understanding of the system in general. And the way these systems used to work would be pretty basic. You would have your alternator here, and then of course you've got your um, plug into the alternator, you've got a battery positive uh, cable, um, the alternator may have a ground cable or it may be just um, grounded because it's bolted to the frame, whatever. But of course you got your connector here and of course this connector uh, that most people ignore for us, of course, we know how important that is and what the uh, feedbacks are from those wires in that connector and we talk about that on the pay channel in detail. But one of these wires, one of them, is going to be an alternator output feed that goes to your um, charging indicator light. And then, of course, uh, the battery uh, positive is going to be connected ultimately to the battery positive and your battery negative is over there and we've got an ultimately it doesn't go directly to the battery of course but we're just simplifying it uh, that light goes to the battery positive ultimately usually through a fuse and uh, like that so the way this system works is very simple the power for the light actually comes from the battery, not from the alternator. And the power from the light comes this way and then actually grounds out through the alternator. So we've got our power and our ground giving us voltage drop across the load and of course lights the light. So uh, when we're on, uh, this will be of course with on, Turn the key to on. One of the things you will notice on any car is that the charge indicator light comes on when you turn the key to on. And that, of course, makes sense. Battery's feeding the light and it's grounding out through the alternator, which is not spinning because the engine isn't running. So we've got a regular simple light bulb circuit. The trick is when the alternator is running. So when the alternator is running, 
what's going to happen is the alternator is going to be producing the same amount of voltage as what you will be getting from battery voltage. And of course, that's going to be uh, somewhere around 14 volts or so. So alternators running, we're of course charging the battery up. Um, so on the battery positive, we've got like 14.2 volts, which means we've got 14.2 volts coming to the bulb. However, we also, because the alternator is running, the function of this wire is to also feed back alternator voltage. And so now we've got a little um, pushing match going on, an arm wrestling match over this indicator light. If we have 14.2 volts coming from the alternator, but also we've got 14.2 volts from the battery, well now we have no voltage drop, so the light is not going to light. But anything less than that, let's say the alternator is not working, well now we've got the same situation as before. You've got, you won't have 14 volts though, alternator's not working, so now you're going to have, oh, like 12.2 maybe for a while 12.8 if it was charging um, for a bit and then it, the alternator failed and stopped uh, but you're going to have somewhere around 12.6 now of course after a while that battery is going to start getting weaker uh, maybe you get down to uh, 11.5 volts or whatever but whatever the case is the point is you're going to have that charge indicator light on because you have voltage drop across your load it also can work a little bit quantitatively, and that is, let's say you've got a situation here where you've got your um, battery at 12.6 volts, but your alternator is only somewhat working. So your alternator is actually putting out maybe 10.2. Now, of course, that's not going to be enough to charge the battery. What's going to happen here? is that that 12 volts is going to kind of overcome that 10.2. And that's going to happen here as well. You've got 12 volts here. You've only got 10.2 here. So you're going to still have a voltage drop across the bulb of 2.4 volts. And that's still going to ground out through the alternator. So what you're going to have is the charge indicator light come on, but it's going to be kind of dim. And those of you guys that are old enough to remember these older charge indicator light things, you would sometimes see it where it would flash and glow with different intensities sometime. And that's because of the failing alternator producing some voltage, but it's losing that arm wrestling match. So you get brighter or dimmer light from that charge indicator. So a uh, very simple system and that's um, not the way that I believe this one is going to work. The way this system is going to work is going to be um, similar but it's not going to be quite as quantitative like this. You're going to have your alternator here. You're going to then have your um, wires coming out for the different functions that uh, we're aware of from the other channel. One of them of course is going to be the charge indicator and hopefully that's producing 14.2 volts or so and what's going to actually happen is that is going to go into a uh, microprocessor so it's not going to be quite as uh, mechanical as this um, earlier model is and then that microprocessor is within the dashboard and um, how that works exactly I'm not totally sure but the microprocessor is going to be able to do things like determine the exact amount of voltage and also in the, um, the case where the voltage is anything less than the battery voltage when the alternator should be producing power, it's going to just turn on that dummy light and um, it, it's not going to be a light bulb lit up from the actual charging system thing here. It's just going to be something that the dashboard light turns on and it's not going to be quantitative and all that. So uh, either way, whether it's this model, whether it's this model, I am suspecting there's going to be an issue here with this wiring where um, there is some kind of possible short to ground or something where that light is uh, going to be on when it shouldn't be, even though your alternator is still putting out 14.2 volts. 
it would be charging the battery and uh, you would be fine. It's just that the sensing system doesn't see it. That's what I'm expecting uh, if they are correct at that um, automotive shop on the uh, alternator and battery being fine. It's going to be some problem with this wire. So I will have to uh, either pull up a wiring diagram or what we're actually going to do is I'm just going to hunt for that wire using a uh, DVOM myself. But uh, let's get this car in here and we'll take a look. Slight complication, guys. So I actually went to pull the car into the garage and the light is not on. Uh, the owner said that it actually hasn't been on all day. I didn't realize this was an intermittent problem, so uh, that adds a new level of challenge to us. So I think what we're going to do is uh, maybe take the car around for a ride a little bit, see if we can get that charging light to come on, and I'm going to go ahead and bring a DVOM with us, and we'll um, do some checks. So let's, um, you know what, uh, actually strike that. Let's get some basic checks first. And then we'll take the car for a spin. So let me go ahead and pull this car in anyway. All right, what do I always say? Get your baselines first. We have a situation where we aren't having the issue. We need to see what those baselines are when we don't have the light on. Um, this also really kind of helps confirm the fact that we are going to have possibly some kind of wiring problem uh, if this alternator and battery are good. I mean, right now, unfortunately, this could be as simple as just a loose battery cable or something, but I'm sure they would have found that at a shop. Uh, so what I'm going to do is measure at the um, terminals on the battery. We can see 14.2 volts. This alternator is working. That's all there is to it. This alternator is absolutely working. Let me check inside one more time. Why don't you guys come with me? Now we got the door ajar. Close the door, and we have no warning lights at all. We have nothing. Nothing at all, so uh, we will have to take this for a drive, see if we can get this thing to come on. All right, we've got a beautiful day in Denver. Really hot though, but not a cloud in the sky. So I wanna get this diagnosis done and enjoy this day. All right, and ow, I don't wanna mess with all that. Um, we got new house construction going on up there. I really don't feel like bothering with that. Let's go this way. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm trying to bump over my driveway a little bit to shake up the car, see if we can get some vibration. And uh, do not have the light on. Nothing going on here. Well, let's keep driving around for a little bit. We'll see what we can find. Let's try this way. As I've mentioned before, with uh, intermittents like this, the variables that I look for typically are going to be um, temperature, vibration, accessories. Oh, accessories, that, that is one. Uh, one possibility, let's turn lights on. Um, do things to try to load this alternator up. Um, I'm going to turn rear defrost on. Um, but uh, a lot of times with electrical problems, when you add accessories, uh, if they share a circuit, turning an accessory on can sometimes cause this kind of an issue. Try to go where I think there's going to be some rough road. Vibration for sure, a uh, very good one. Um, moisture also, uh, things that are exposed out to the environment. How many times you guys have seen me troubleshoot things and I always go for any components that would have the most exposure to the environment first and uh, generally get pretty good on my, on my guesses on um, where I want to narrow down. Right now I cannot get this light to light up. And we've got all accessories on and everything. So I'm doing everything I can. I think this road is closed up here, if I'm not mistaken. All right, I'm going to drive around a little bit and um, try to get this light to come on. All right, guys. Well, I have been driving around for about five minutes, and I cannot get 
this light to come on. And I know it will. The guy sent me a text of it. So uh, I am not quite sure what the deal is. But uh, what we're going to do is um, this does give us an indication this is going to be electrical. And uh, as I mentioned, what some of the variables I look for. So we're going to induce some of those variables. We're going to do some wire wiggling and uh, stuff like that and see if we can get this light to come on. Check it out. Look, look, the light just came on just now, right before I pull up to my house. So now I want to do the exact opposite. Now I want to be very ginger here and not vibrate or change anything because what we want to do now, let's pull in here. We want to measure and see if we still have 14.2 volts from that alternator while this light is on. And uh, if we do, then my suspicion is correct about that um, indicator wire being some kind of fault. Now, if we measure this alternator and it shows like 12.6 volts, quite honestly, I'm going to be a little disappointed in that shop, honestly. Uh, so let's see what we get. I'm going to keep the car running. I'm going to gently open the hood here and... Oh, the light's still on. It's just the door jar. We got the battery light still on there. Let's go check it out. All right, let's see what we get here. And we have 10.23 volts. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. Well, it's nothing like I was expecting. This car needs an alternator. That's, that's all there is to it. And wow, the voltage is dropping rather rapidly. Um, but the car's still running fine and everything, but I think what's happening is because it's um, intermittent, there are times when the battery gets charged and then when the light comes on, the battery charges enough to hold them over until they get where they're going. So they never noticed any drivability issues. But um, yeah, that, that is pretty low voltage. I would expect some drivability issues before too long, but again, we can probably get this alternator to work again through uh, one of our variables, vibration. I'm just gonna take a pry rod here and I'm gonna bang on the alternator. There it is right there. Come on. All right, there we go. After banging around on this thing for like five minutes, I finally did get it to kick on. Okay, the light is out. I'm gonna say most likely this is a bad alternator, but again, remember what I said, uh, another thing that could cause this could just be loose wiring as well. All right, I can see that connector for the alternator. I'm gonna reach in there and kind of pry around on the connector. This time I don't wanna cause vibration or bump the alternator or anything. We wanna just strictly see if this is a wiring phenomenon. So I'm gonna loop around the wiring harness here and I'm gonna tug that wire harness like that. And we can see wiggling the wires around has no effect whatsoever. Uh, the other connection is gonna be the battery positive. That's right here. Wiggling the wire on the battery positive, absolutely no effect, none whatsoever. But bang on the alternator a bit. And there we go, we can make it fail. So there's some internal failure on that alternator. Car needs an alternator, that's all. Nothing spectacular here. Just some pretty poor diagnostics at that shop. All right, now it just kicked in on itself again. Um, part of me is tempted to bring the scope out and do a ripple test on this alternator to see what it looks like, but uh, Quite honestly, kind of don't have time for that. Uh, this car is going to get an alternator, and that'll fix it. So we are done on this car. Diagnosis complete. All right, guys. Well, my apologies. I was expecting something with significantly more drama and flair than that, but we just have a bad alternator that was uh, just incorrectly diagnosed at the shop again. Um, but... Uh, Wow. Um, anyway, the type of car that was was a 2014 
Ford uh, Escape, I believe it was. And um, I don't think I mentioned the type of car, but it doesn't matter. That design is pretty ubiquitous for just about all vehicles. And uh, at very worst, uh, we would have pulled up a wiring diagram and done some integrity checks on that sensing circuit, but we can see the sensing circuit works perfectly fine. Everything works except the alternator uh, and that diagnostician. Uh, so that leaves one car left to diagnose, and we've got the uh, brakes grabbing or some kind of drag or something on the rear wheels of a, it uh, looks like an Infiniti QX60 right in front of me here. So let's take that for a spin around the neighborhood and see what we can find. Again, drawing our baselines, we want to see what the customer complaint actually is and that we are on the same page with that customer for anything we feel. Um, I, I uh, can tell you how important this is to do. One of the, the previous cars that I worked on, the customer said that there was a transmission slip and I was driving the car extensively, never felt a transmission slip. What I did feel though was some loose suspension or ball joints or things that when I took off from a stoplight or stop sign, you could feel a little bit of a shift or jerking in the suspension. It turns out that's what the customer complaint was. They were calling it a slip, but it, it really wasn't more a slip, it was more of a clunk or jerk or shifting uh, of the um, suspension. So uh, you, you really want to make sure that you get that baseline drawn so that you know you're focusing on the same complaint that the customer is describing. Uh, what, what a slip is to me is a lot different than what the slip is to this customer, for example. So um, he's describing this as a, a binding or grabbing when he turns the vehicle. So uh, I don't know what that means. We're going to find out. Here it is. Looks about, about around 2014 also on this Infinity. So one of the things you will notice uh, is the quality of the vehicles that I am typically working on now is uh, grades above the pieces of crap I often worked on uh, in years past when I first started doing this stuff about seven or eight years ago. Um, so the trust level I get from uh, people to service their babies is clearly increasing, which is a good thing. Check for any ABS lights or anything here, nothing. Uh, but if you guys have been around the channel a while, oh my God, some of those cars that would come in, but yeah, it's because people uh, aren't gonna trust some asshat who isn't a mechanic uh, working out of their home garage on the weekends, right? So, uh, but now word has gotten around quite a bit. And uh, as a matter of fact, I even do some work for some shops doing diagnostic for them occasionally. So um, definitely, things are picking up and good God, I am busy. I am doing cars all the time and uh, trying to also respect my neighbors in this nice new area that I'm at where, uh, you know, I wouldn't expect it would fly quite as well as in my old uh, neighborhood. This is actually a retirement community, believe it or not. All right, let's go ahead and hit it. And uh, right now I don't feel anything binding. Make a turn. Oh yeah, oh absolutely. Something is, uh, that wheel isn't spinning. Let's see if you can hear it. There's a, a jerking. It, it feels like the wheel is not spinning and I'm just pulling it along, but you could hear it skidding and jerking. No anti-lock brake warning. Feels like it may be from the left rear. So I know you guys can't uh, feel it. So I wanna try turning to the right now. I don't think we're gonna see anything on the dashboard, but this is gonna be a mechanical hindrance. So we're making a kind of a curve to the right. It feels pretty good. Oh, do you guys hear that? You can hear the wheel actually squealing like like if you peel out it's only when I seem to make a left turn I want to see if it does it when I make a right turn but yeah it feels like the wheel isn't turning uh, and it's only on turns so um, 
I'm not quite sure what that would be. Maybe a possibly bad wheel bearing. You'd expect you'd hear that wheel bearing roaring right about now. But yeah, it's unmistakable. It, it feels like if you apply the brakes to only one wheel. Let's make a right turn. I didn't really feel it there. Do another right turn. Nope, didn't feel it there. It seems to only be when you make a left turn. And that would be interesting because it felt like it was coming from the left rear wheel. A left turn is going to take weight off of that bearing and off of all the suspension there. So if the uh, left rear wheel bearing was the problem, I would expect it to be worse when I make a right turn and putting more load on it. Let's make another right turn here. Oh, that feels really good. Let's go ahead and make a left turn. And yeah, maybe it's the right wheel that's doing it. It sounds like the left. Now you can feel it. The, the car kind of jerks a bit. And you can hear it squeal. Yeah. It's only on left turns. All right. Let's go ahead and get this uh, car up on jack stands. See what would explain this. And actually, I changed my mind. I want to do a couple of experiments. I want to see if it makes a difference if it does it while I'm braking or not. I wasn't braking earlier. And now I'm braking and it won't do it, but of course I'm going a lot slower. Let's see if I can do it at a place I can pick up some speed. And sure enough, there's a car there. All right. The other thing about this neighborhood is a bunch of, being a retirement community, there's a bunch of old people here. Everybody drives like five miles under the speed limit. I really don't fit in here. All right, let's go this way. God, everybody's out for their Sunday walk and All right, let's try doing this while holding the brake. Nope, it still does it. Does it exactly the same even when holding the brake. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure it's a braking issue. I don't think it's a braking issue because applying the brakes doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, I can tell you when I just coast the vehicle, we're on a slight upgrade right now and I'm just letting the vehicle coast and I don't feel it dragging or pulling to one side. Uh, it, it will just coast forever. So I don't believe we have any brake binding or anything like that. Parking brakes stuck. So I'm not quite sure what we got. And uh, didn't do it that time on my left turn. All right, either case, let's bring this into the garage and let's see what we got here. All right, I am curious. Yeah, I wouldn't buy race deck because you're gonna damage it if you use jack stands and I do a lot of automotive stuff. Oh, God, don't you just love the internet? So um, I've done a pretty thorough inspection on this. This is that left wheel that um, felt to me like it was what was binding and I also checked out the right. I don't see any evidence of the brakes binding. Um, don't see any suspension problems. Wheel bearings are both solid. Uh, so um, the only thing I noticed is this is a all-wheel drive. So it has a rear differential and I'm kind of wondering if there's a problem with that rear differential. So I believe, believe what we're going to do is I'm just going to do a quick dirty check. Um, by draining some of the differential fluid and uh, take a look, see what it looks like. Typically with a bad differential, that alone will be sufficient to make a diagnosis if this uh, rear differential has an issue. Uh, this drain bolt is stripped. I wonder if somebody's been in here before or something, but uh, I'm gonna see if this will help with that. There it goes. 
some of the other things besides this that I'll look for are um, if the shocks are sagging and maybe when you're turning the vehicle, you're rubbing the tire with the wheel well. That, of course, is not happening on this vehicle. All right, how many times have we seen this on the channel? There's a really good view right there. All those metal particles in that little bit of differential fluid. Um, that differential is toasted. We have seen this both with transmissions and engines uh, probably more than a dozen times on this channel. Wow, look at that. Um, but it is curious to me how, how clean this fluid looks otherwise. I wonder if they tried to change the fluid or something um, because they suspected this is a problem. I, I don't really have the whole story on this. I just only have the symptoms. But very often after I dig more, you guys have seen this too, uh, you, you find more information from the customer as you look into it. But um, it explains that stripped bolt to uh, drain the fluid as well as uh, why the fluid looks clear other than all these metal particles floating in it. All right, well, the fun part's done. Now I've got to do all of my brainless wrenching and parts changing. But uh, quite honestly, I would love nothing more than to only do the diagnostics and uh, leave the parts changing to uh, the professionals. You guys are well aware if I am incorrect on a diagnosis, and I put a part in the car that was not necessary, I pay for that part. So um, I do have to do the repairs in order to live up to that guarantee uh, because I don't trust another place to, to make the correct call and do it. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll be spinning wrenches this weekend instead of enjoying that beautiful weather that you saw earlier. But uh, at least you guys get to enjoy this video. I will be putting some new stuff up on the pay channel very soon. If you haven't been on the pay channel for a while, we've got a bunch of new material up there, uh, including network diagnostics and um, I don't remember what else. But uh, if you haven't been on there for a few weeks, uh, definitely want to check it out. Some good videos and material up there. Also, don't forget, I still have merchandise. So if you are interested in uh, Schrodinger's Box merchandise, I don't know what happened on the mobile, but the merch shelf no longer appears under the video on the mobile, but I will put a link to the merch shelf on this video so you can get your cool Schrodinger's Box swag. I really appreciate your viewership, and we will catch you next time.